Good afternoon, and welcome to Core Technology Conversations, brought to you by Research Cores in the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. My name is Thomas Graziano, and I'm the director of the Research Cores, and will be your moderator for today. Research Cores are federally compliant, fee-for-service, shared resources that provide access to instruments, technologies, as well as expert consultation and other services to scientific and clinical investigators. We currently have seven active cores at, FAA, at FAU. A list of these cores can be found on our FAU Research Cores website. This seminar series will let you know more about those cores and give you a glimpse into some of the amazing research each one is capable of. Today's presentation will be by Kathy Freeman. Kathy currently serves as the director of the Biostatistics Collaborative Corps. She received her do uh, doctorate in biostatistics from Columbia School of Public Health and is an expert in the design and statistical analysis of multi-center randomized clinical trials and observational studies. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Kathy Freeman. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate the audience that I have today, and I uh, also want to thank the Division of Research for facilitating this talk. Okay, I'm going to be talking about clinical trials in the eras of the AIDS epidemics, the opioid epidemics, and certainly more currently the uh, COVID pandemic. Slide two, please. Okay, and I'm going to tell a story about how to design a randomized clinical trial by giving some examples. The first would be with the AIDS epidemic. It was the earliest NIH-funded uh, randomized clinical trial uh, that recruited patients in 1986. It was a double-blind study involving 282 subjects, and it uh, compared AZT with a placebo. The second is a study that my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Heather Howard from the College of Design and Social Inquiry and I had gotten together. It's called a cluster randomized design and it compares uh, peer support specialists trained in shared decision-making uh, and their uh, help and care for pregnant women with opioid use disorder. And this study involves, uh, it's a feasibility study, it's a small study, it involves six peer support specialists who are randomized to receiving either standard of care plus a sham interve educational intervention versus those peer support specialists who receive standard of care and a uh, shared decision-making module. In addition, there's an independent control group. Uh, the study is under review by NIH at present. Okay, the next study involves the COVID epidemic or pandemic, and it involves a comparison of hydrochloroquine uh, for patient, people who have been exposed to others with the diagnosis of COVID. They're not wearing masks or uh, any kind of intervention and they've been with this patient for more than 10 minutes and they're within six feet away from it. And this trial was published this summer in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, it didn't show any uh, evidence of efficacy. Uh, it enrolled 821 uh, subjects and it was uh, stopped due to what's called futility, that we just couldn't find a difference. Okay, the final trial is the vaccine trial that you may have heard of. It is sponsored by uh, Moderna and it involves NIH. NIH uh, did collaborate with Moderna on a phase one study, meaning a few healthy volunteers that uh, participated to assess you know, safety and potential efficacy of the vaccine. The trial is, has enrolled 30,000 subjects. It completed enrollment within a few days uh, ago. So, and the trial is ongoing. And it's uh, people in the trial will be followed for two years. Slide please, three please. The most important thing in research is the research question. What is the purpose of the study? And for that, you have to understand the patient population, the intervention, and certainly the outcomes. 
But I'd like to categorize those research questions into three groups. One would be therapeutic. Well, given the, the HIV AIDS epidemic, ACT versus placebo was clearly a therapeutic trial because what they wanted to find out was whether the time to death had, was shorter in those patients randomized to ACT compared with those to placebo. They also wanted to look at the inc incidence of opportunistic infection. In the uh, PWOOD trial, the pregnant women with opioid use disorder, the one of the outcomes, the primary outcome actually, is maternal capacity. Can the woman retain her infant after delivery, even though she's in a recovery program? Okay, so we're trying to prevent the child going to foster care. Another outcome of the study is uh, treatment retention during the, in the recovery center, and also mental health depression of the mom. Uh, the next category of trials is a prophylactic or prevention trial. Well, the, the, as I said, the P would, would prevent uh, infant remo removal, so it kind of straddles the fence between those. There are therapeutic outcomes as well as uh, prophylactic outcomes. Uh, the hydroxy clinical trial with those people exposed to patients with COVID uh, is trying to prevent symptomatic infection uh, in a 14-day period after exposure to the patient with COVID. Certainly in the vaccine trial, this is a preventive trial. We're trying to prevent uh, COVID infection among those people who've received the vac vaccine. And we're looking at actually time to infection and possibly time to reinfection. We don't know that yet. The next category would be diagnostic. And a way back when, a long time ago, when I was working with an investigator, he had wanted to compare a long tool to assess the risk of using drugs in pregnant women and compare it with a shorter version of that scale. And then what we would do would be to compare the outcomes of each scale with the results from a urinary tox screen. The, for each of these trials and most trials, one would have to consider the safety component. And to evaluate the safety component, we certainly look at adverse events and serious adverse events in the trial. And regardless of whether it's behavioral therapy intervention or you know, a drug intervention, there are always safety issues. Uh, typically, one would devise a what's called data and safety monitoring board to monitor the data as they accrue for completeness, accuracy, and also the safety of participants. In addition, the vaccine trial, the data and safety monitoring board will be monitoring for possible increased risk of COVID. Uh, perhaps people feel that they're, uh, they're uh, protected uh, due to the vaccine, so they may expose, be exposed to other people um, more frequently. Okay, there's another dimension to these trials, and that involves feasibility. And a feasibility trial, like the PWOOD trial, focuses on the methodology. This is a small trial, and what we're doing is trying to find out whether the, uh, the, uh, the specialists, the peer support specialists, are adhering to the kind of rules that were set down. I hate to use rules, it's too severe a word, but the guidelines for caring for women uh, who are pregnant, who have an opioid use disorder. And also feasibility trials try to derive better estimates of efficacy and safety uh, so that future designs, uh, trials can be designed uh, more appropriately. In talking about trials, we want to talk about the challenges of conducting a trial. And there could be low recruitment rate, uh, there could be differential dropout rate, which would really bias results 
if patients in one group uh, don't want to swallow, you know, very large capsules, uh, they might be dropping out more frequently. If they, uh, if the other group is taking the drug and they have side effects, so you know there are reasons for um, one group not adhering or dropping out uh, more so than another. In the early AIDS trials, uh, it was noticed that the, the adherence to medication or compliance, as they said way back then, uh, was relatively low. So they initiated uh, the technology or the need for technology to use smart caps on drug vials. Okay. You could also have bias in a study uh, when a trial recruits patients or people from social media outreach, such as what was done in the hydroxy trial. Slide four, please. Okay, so the other thing is once we get the purpose of the study, we want to talk about the treatment and how it's administered. So we have an intervention, we define the intervention, we define the control group, and we define the regimen at which the treatment is provided. For the ACT AIDS trial, uh, its tablets were provided uh, by mouth, were to be taken by mouth once every four hours uh, for 24 weeks, and hence issues related to compliance or adherence. In the vaccine trial, one would have an injection at day one and also day 29, and those people are followed for two years. Now, a consideration in writing or drafting a treatment section would be, are concomitant treatments allowed in the study? In the HIV trials, people were very, very desperate and they went to homeopathic medicines and herbal medicines and some were working more in a palliative way but some had uh, antagonistic interactions with the drug on the trial. So therefore one would have to really specify what treatments are allowable. Another consideration is, is it possible to mask the formulation of the drug, either using a placebo control or uh, in a behavioral health, it's almost near impossible However, there could be a rater, like I, I've been involved with uh, speech therapy trials where independent raters are listening to the speech of patients with Parkinson's disease and determining how clear the words are. Contamination is a concern. We have that possibility in the Peewood trial and that's why we chose to include an independent control group. And that control group will allow us to look at the, uh, the actual response to, to the care that a, a, a peer support specialist would give a pregnant woman uh, who's in a recovery center. And that recovery center is you know 50 miles away from the recovery center that's in which the randomized clinical trial is conducted. So the randomized clinical trial has both arms, those peer support specialists with and without the intervention, and by chance, the, uh, the knowledge from the shared decision-making could spin off or contaminate the uh, treatment provided by those peer support specialists who are not uh, who are in the control group. Okay. In the AIDS clinical trial, the ACT trial, it was rumored early on that the, uh, the primarily male population uh, would go to laboratories and have their drugs analyzed because they, were, they felt very desperate. And if they were on ACT, they would go ahead and share their drug with someone who was on, assigned to the placebo group. So that involves contamination. And the statistical issue with regard to contamination is 
that it, it makes the observed difference, you know, at the end of the trial, much smaller than what we'd expect had there been no sharing. Some trials involve fixed dosages and others involve tailored. Tailored dosages are often given uh, to people who develop events like in, in AIDS, those who develop opportunistic infection, sometimes the dosage might be increased to counterbalance uh, the effects of the opportunistic infection or prevent others. Now, in a, you know, having a controlled treatment, you have to look at the comparability of the placebo and the uh, active treatment or treatments. Uh, they have to be comparable with regard to smell, color, taste, capsule size, etc. And no, if it's not blinded, no one group should have outcomes that uh, may be biased. Uh, for example, if it was a pain study to ameliorate pain, uh, then uh, there's a difference, there's a known difference between how men and women assess uh, pain. And certainly you want to make sure that everybody has the same access to care so that results could be generalizable. Slide five, please. Right. In, in defining a patient sample, we want to define the control group. In statistics, one of the most important questions one has to ask is relative to what? We want, we see a new treatment, we think it works, there might be some evidence of efficacy, whatever, but relative to what? A control group that's not getting it? Is it ethical? Whatever. Okay. But there could be a variety of types of control groups. Some could have a a, a, another treatment or alternative treatment that is has been shown not to be effective, but it might be. Okay, and other groups, control groups, might have uh, no treatment at all or standard of care. There could be historical controls in clinical trials. There could be most often concurrent controls, concurrent independent controls, as in the uh, the Peewood trial which uses both randomized controls and concurrent and independent concurrent control. And it's important to note that all controls should be what's called attention matched, meaning that the amount of contact between the participant in the trial and their clinician or caregiver as part of the trial or observer should be the same between those with the active treatment and those who are getting the sham or placebo, uh, because you want to be able to determine whether the treatment is effective, not so much, and you don't want it to be confounded by the clinical care, the amount of clinical care provided to the subject. Okay. Uh, in defining the patient sample, we have to develop uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And we also have to think out of the box in terms of potential sources of bias. In the COVID vaccine trial, we want to include all ages and all those with multiple co comorbidities, as well as those with multiple co comorbidities. We also want to define um, subgroups that may not adhere to the, the uh, to be compliant with the treatment regimen, i.e. those who have no health insurance. So we want to be sensitive to try to recruit those patients also, or those participants also. Slide six, please. So there are a variety of statistical concerns in terms of defining your patient population for recruitment of a sample into the trial. If you have very restrictive criteria, then the sample will be less variable and therefore that'll result in greater power or the ability to detect a statistically significant difference if there is one. But if the criteria is so restrictive, then you're gonna need a lot more time to accrue subjects into the study. The inferences will also be limited because you can only generalize from your sample definition 
to the general population with the same characteristics. In the hydroxy trial, we have criteria involving they, the person had to be within six feet, having no mask or shield uh, for more than 10 minutes of someone diagnosed with COVID. Okay, well, some, how, how, um, how doable is it to measure six feet? Uh, how valid is it? How precise is it to measure 10 or more minutes? Uh, so inadvertently, you may be excluding subjects incorrectly. And who gets in could create a bias. For the ACT AIDS trial, 90, more than 95% of people in that trial were white males. And as a result of that, and seeing how the AIDS epidemic evolved, NIH and certainly other sponsors really uh, promote recruitment of women and stratification perhaps by men and women uh, to be able to analyze differences uh, among women, uh, which may be different from among men. There might be certainly obvious criteria uh, with regard to defining the patient sample, such as the PWID trial. Uh, there are women of childbearing age who happen to be pregnant, and there are you know, women of a particular age. So that, that really defines them uh, quite well. Now, with, the, with regard to other studies, the, the studies that I've described were typically parallel arm studies. They're, they're uh, prospective, uh, randomized studies. And, but given that, there are other variations on this theme, and one of which is called a factorial design, which basically is a parallel arm design with uh, more than two arms. So for example, <clears throat> if you have two treatments, and in the HIV AIDS world, uh, after AZT, there were other, uh, other drugs that looked promising and the people who were designing trials of which I was one of, uh, were talking about using cocktails, combination of different drugs. So there could be drug A and drug B and a factorial design would include with those two treatments would include one arm that in included both treatment A and B, one arm that included treatment A only, and then another with B only, and another with standard of care. <clears throat> now the value of this kind of study design is that you can test for what's called an interaction effect. And that means that given the combination of A and B, you can determine whether the combination had either a synergistic, a good effect, or an antagonistic effect, a bad effect, um, above and beyond what you'd expect by giving treatment A alone or treatment B alone. Okay. Then through the HIV AIDS epidemic, we have what's called a pragmatic trial uh, that came to the forefront because AIDS activists wanted more, and rightly so, more patients of different backgrounds to be included in trials. So what they did was talk about uh, parallel tracks whereby the physician and the patient decide what regimen and what treatment uh, the patient should be on. Now, in the AZT trial, NIH funded just a select number of uh, centers, academic medical centers, to, to conduct these trials. And people around those academic medical centers were a fairly homogeneous group. They typically came from, uh, from urban areas and uh, you know, were, as I said, primarily white males. So opening this up, uh, really try to include other uh, uh, people of, with other characteristics. And then finally, 
uh, with regard to a selection of study designs, there's the cluster randomized trial, which PWID is an example. Uh, the peer support specialists are randomized to either standard of care plus a sham, which is some educational modality, but it has no bearing on their care of patients, or the peer support specialists are randomized to standard of care and, a, and modules of education for shared decision-making. And the PWIDs, the pregnant women with opioid use disorder are clustered within each peer support specialist. Because there's this non-independence of, uh, of pregnant women who are cared for by a specialist, we have to design this as a cluster randomized trial. Next slide, please. Okay, this is, this is uh, getting away from a little about the design, but it relates to it because people wanna find out results and they wanna get a quick idea of what's happening in a study. This is a, for the COVID, it's an example using, well, fictitious COVID data. It's a, called a multi-state model stack probability plot. And we have two pictures, one for the treatment group and one for a control group. And basically what these, these little pictures do is, is present the relative proportion or the probability that patients who, in this case, enter a hospital with a diagnosis of COVID and are followed for a month. And we want to see at each day what the distribution of outcomes is. And in this case, the outcomes are all dichotomous. They're either you know, alive or not. They're not ventilated or not. They're ventilated or not, or they died. So where, where the y-axis indicates the proportion or the probability of COVID patients who are part of this co uh, cohort who have each of these outcomes. And you can see by looking at the different colors that the lighter orange uh, is much, the area of the lighter orange is much uh, larger for the treatment group as opposed to the control group. So we can say, hey, something's going on that the treatment seems to be um, you know, working more. So the bad outcomes are, have a greater area and they appear to be in the control group as opposed to the treatment group. Next slide, please. Okay, I wanna talk about, we're talking about randomized clinical trials. I wanna talk about the notion of randomization. And often people in, in these four trials that I've discussed, the proportion of people in one group as opposed to another is the same. So it's a 50-50 or a randomization at ratio of one to one, but that's not necessarily the case. The definition of uh, randomization is that each participant has a known probability of assignment. And in the AIDS clinical trials, they, uh, activists wanted more people to be assigned or allocated to to the active treatments. So in some trials, there might have been a four to three to one ratio with one being the placebo group. Okay. Some dimensions of randomization including, uh, include blocked randomization. Well, blocked randomization is such that after a certain number of participants are enrolled in the study, let's say eight, then there'll be the same number of participants in each of one of two treatment groups. I mean, you could have many treatment groups, but this is just an example. In the hydroxy trial, uh, they used what's called a permuted block randomization and var with varying block sizes. Uh, their block sizes were two, four, or eight so that they, the benefit of this is that at the end of the study, they will have reasonably uh, balanced groups in terms of numbers, not so much characteristics, but numbers. 
So I, I believe they had 841 subjects. So, uh, you know, there'd be approximately 820 in each group, you know, something like that. Um, and a randomization could go bad, meaning that by chance, you know, 8% could end up in one treatment group than another, uh, even though the randomization ratio is one to one if, if the uh, randomization is, is not blocked. But there's a very small probability of that happening. Another aspect of randomization is called stratification, where basically you're randomizing within groups, within stratum. In the ACT AIDS trial, patients were randomized according to whether their CD4 count was below 100 or 100 or, or over. And they were also stratified according to center. In the hydroxy trial, they were stratified according to country. There were some patients who came from the United States and others who came from Canada. In the vaccine trial that's ongoing now, there are three stratum. Those who are under 65, with comorbidities, those under 65 without comorbidities, and those over 65 or 65 and over with or without comorbidities. So those three stratum uh, patients are, uh, participants are randomized within each of those three stratum. So that uh, at the end of the study, we could actually, it would be valid to analyze treatment effects within each of these uh, stratum. And also what they did was a very smart thing. They specified that no one stratum should have uh, less than 25% of the total number or more than 40%. So you want relatively even distributions of patients assigned in each of these three stratum. Random numbers can come from a random number table or I've done, you know, used computer programs to generate random number assignments uh, for randomization envelopes. Uh, it could also be done centrally whereby the randomization scheme is given to either, you know, a pharmacist or a administrative central uh, body who you would call up or go on the computer and they generate a random um, number assignment to that participant. Now, one of the benefits of randomization is that it avoids subjective selection bias. And people don't realize that if they were to assign people to different groups, that that, may, that type of bias may creep in. So randomization does away with that. Uh, it also attempts to balance the groups for characteristics uh, given large sample size. Well, certainly 30,000 is a large sample size, but they're balancing them uh, characteristics for both known and unknown characteristics. Next slide, please. Okay, NIH and PCORI want evidence-based results uh, that are adopted widely. They don't just want you to give, they don't want to just give you money to conduct research. They want it to be translatable to the population, to people who could use the treatment. And REAIM is, REAIM is an acronym. Uh, the first letter refers to REACH. You want to reach those enrolled uh, who are representative. So you want to be able to recruit people who meet the characteristics at first glance, but some of those people may withdraw or decline participation. And you want to make sure that the sample that you have included in your randomized trial is representative of the entire group uh, who you reached out to. Certainly the next item is effectiveness or efficacy. And did the intervention do what we expected? But you also have to look at safety, safety issues in a clinical trial, regardless of whether it's a behavioral or a drug intervention. The next 
item is adoption. How acceptable were the intervention to the care staff or the people who were evaluating the, uh, uh, you know, the treatment uh, and the responses to these treatments? The last item would be, in, uh, the next last item is implementation. Uh, and that involves, is the study doable? Is fidelity high? Are staff and others adhering to the treatment regimen or the educational regimen or caring for patients in a particular way due to the intervention? The last item involves maintenance. Uh, how sustainable is the intervention effect? Well, you could, you could ask that in two different ways. Does, is the treatment effect sustainable or can the organization in which the program is conducted as part of the randomized clinical trial, will they be able to sustain it with very little capital investment? We used REAIM for the NIH uh, randomized clinical trial, cluster randomized trial for the PWOOD. Uh, in the AIDS HIV realm, they, uh, activists realized, I mean, they didn't, they didn't actually coin it as a pragmatic trial, but they moved to pragmatic trials. They felt that they want to enroll a greater um, uh, scope of, of patients, uh, patients with various characteristics. In the COVID trial, there has been a few studies, a few uh, surveys, one of which we're doing here, uh, with regard to how willing the public is in adopting uh, or taking the uh, vaccine. How willing are they to take the vaccine? Next slide, please. I want to go over briefly the phases in testing new drugs in the U.S. There are preclinical testing, uh, which are done in animals or cells or whatever, or simulations. There, are, uh, there is a phase one, a phase zero trial, which are pharmacokinetic studies in healthy volunteers, uh, excretion of the drug, half-life, et cetera. Phase one involves healthy volunteers, typically between 20 and 100 uh, in number. Uh, the vaccine trial, the COVID vaccine trial, uh, NIH partnered with Moderna to do conduct a phase one trial to get a glimpse of certainly safety, but also potential efficacy. The a phase two trial uh, involves typically between 50 and 300 patients or participants. In the AZT trial, there were 282 uh, there. Uh, the AZT certainly provided some suggestion of efficacy. Actually, they, they stopped the trial early because patients on AZT were living uh, a median of four months longer than those on, uh, in the control or placebo group. Uh, now, that prompted later trials of AZT that compared various dosages of AZT. Uh, because in the initial ACT trial, they found that a lot of people were having uh, adverse events. Okay. In a phase three study, it's really looking for uh, effectiveness and safety uh, versus a standard if there is one. And uh, if you're successful in a phase three trial, then the treatment will be ready for market. Typically, the trial involves between 300 and 3,000. In the COVID vaccine trial, we have 10 times as many subjects. A phase four trial, it's really not a trial, it's really a post-marketing surveillance, which basically looks at people who are taking the drug and uh, physicians determine, uh, the patients determine, they go to their physicians, uh, to determine whether there are any adverse events and those are recorded in the registry. Just as a, a note, the, when the AZT trial was 
first published, the FDA then immediately uh, expedited the pathway for AZT to be used as treatment, even though it was kind of a phase two trial. So in these earlier trials, the, they've informed later trials. Okay, I want to talk briefly about uh, determining sample size and biostatistics consideration. Another way of saying determining sample size would be to conduct what's called a power analysis. First of all, there is no one formula to use to determine the appropriate number for of subjects to be recruited for your clinical trial. You need to know, and I need to know as a biostatistician, what the design is. And certainly I would wanna to contribute to the design in terms of perhaps you know, confounding factors. The design could be a test of difference, association, or equivalence. Uh, you will, would want to define the outcome very carefully because in the HIV AIDS trial, we're looking at time to death, and that involves a different set of statistical methods to do a power analysis than looking at the incidence of opportunistic infections. Okay, I would sit down with someone and discuss what is the smallest clinically important difference and what is the variability associated with that difference? What's in the literature? In the hydroxy trial, COVID trial, we, they assumed that those people who were near others with COVID had a 10% risk of getting the disease within 14 days. And the trial wanted to produce a reduction or this drug was assumed to produce a reduction of 50%. And that's, that information was used in determining the sample size. In the vaccine trial, they want to protect 60% of the population and no less than 30%. And they assume that based upon information available that in six months, you'd have a 0.75 infection rate and that 15% would be excluded. There would be a, an attrition rate uh, uh, of 15% and that would have to be factored into the power analysis. And that uh, attrition rate could be due to people taking the first injection and not doing well or having a sore arm or whatever and not wanting to go back for the second one. Okay, also in performing a power analysis, you need to know the alpha error or the probability of stating that there's a difference, but when it really, there really is no difference, so you're making an error. Or the beta error, which is the probability of failing to come up with a to detect an important difference when there really is one. Okay, the, the sample size also depends upon how many outcomes you have in your study and also having multiple time points. Okay. In the AC tree trial, they also did analyses on a subset of data of participants who had CD4 counts below 100. And that would impact on analyses. Why? Because the more analyses that you do, you're increasing the chance of coming up with false positive findings. You want to guard against that. So you have to make it more difficult to find a difference. Hence, you increase the sample size. Slide 13, please. Okay. It also uh, sample size also depends upon the number and the, the methodology used for conducting interim analyses. And uh, the randomization ratio, once you deviate more from a one-to-one -one randomization ratio, you need a larger sample size. And certainly the variability in your sample. In the vaccine trial, they want to do a per protocol analysis, which means that they're only going to look at people who have taken both injections of the drug. Okay. 
as opposed to an intention to treat analysis where you're analyzing everybody as they're allocated regardless of the amount of drug that they're, uh, they've received. Slide 14, please. There are resources for helping you write randomized clinical trial protocols and for reporting results. The spirit uh, basically list or statement uh, lists the, the components that should be included in the clinical trial protocol. And the consort provides what components should be included in reporting randomized trials. The consort came first uh, and basically the spirit, in a sense, mirrors the consort. So next slide, please. And I just wanna say that randomized clinical trial is the gold standard of study designs. And if you think that the biostatistics collaborative core just deals in randomized clinical trials or studies, um, there are many other examples that I have that may or may not involve health, and some of which are surveys uh, uh, involving perhaps, for example, the COVID vaccine priorities, uh, another survey involving uh, families with a child on the autism spectrum, the opioid use and pregnancy medical care survey went out to obstetricians and gynecologists in terms of you know, how they're providing care to women with um, opioid use disorder, uh, surveys of women at high risk for breast cancer. Longitudinal studies involve uh, trends in South Florida shark concentrations, also an epidemiologic study of toxins emanating from Lake Okeechobee, um, a, a, a economic health economic study with regard to factors predictive of continuing conversion of Medicaid providers uh, from paper healthcare records to an electronic format. And also we're doing a relationship between that factor and incidence of COVID cases and deaths. Um, and certainly the Florida Atlantic University factors predicted of academic research success. In the College of Design and Social Inquiry, we have a funded grant from the Presky Foundation that looks at a, whether a smart phone app to inform students about transportation alternatives uh, can uh, be used to uh, sway students to use, uh, you know, to not drive to campus anymore. And then in nursing, another nursing is mindfulness app in pregnant women at high risk. So if you have any idea for research studies uh, at, at any phase, whether it's the embryonic phase of thinking about a question or seeing anecdotal data that would prompt a research question, or you've went ahead and collected data please contact me. I'd be happy to help with uh, any of your research needs. Uh, the Biostatistics Corps is there for, for all your, your statistical needs, your design, epidemiologic, whatever, and we're really happy to help. And thank you very much for um, your participation. And I guess we could go to questions now. Kathy, that, that was a great presentation, a lot of good information for sure. Um, I just want to remind everybody that's currently attending, um, if you have any questions, please hover your mouse at the bottom of the screen. There's a Q&A button there, and you can go ahead and ask any questions that you'd like to ask for Kathy. Um, we do have some time left, so we'll take a few questions now, and then whatever questions we don't get to um, at the end of this presentation, we will add them to the website for you. So let's start here. Let's see what we got. Um, first question. What would be your suggestion about research questions for COVID-19 clinical research? The knowledge about the disease is changing every day. What's the best practice to address new questions and design studies that can produce meaningful information and avoid waste of resources? Well, <clears throat> first, 
I'd like to, you know, meet the person who wants to, is motivated, because I'm very motivated also. Uh, and we uh, basically sit down and have a meeting about uh, what some of the ideas are. We want to look in the literature to determine whether uh, the study's been done, what the quality of a prior study was, whether we can improve upon it, whether we have a new angle. And, uh, and really that's the way to do it. And then we would determine whether it, you know, the study design, whether it's a, a survey or we wanna follow a cohort of perhaps patients with COVID uh, for a longer period of time than what's that's normally done. So, so basically the idea is let's, let's brainstorm, let's think about it. And, uh, I was working with one investigator, Junie Monestein from the College of Business, and she is looking at conversion of paper records into uh, electronic health records. And I thought, well, you know, if these are physicians who are dealing with primarily Medicaid patients, um, is there a bad outcome among these Medicaid patients if they, if their providers don't have electronic healthcare records. So that was my question. I thought of it and I'm analyzing the data and working with Judy and others and um, it's, it's very exciting. So that's how it happens. Um, let's see what we next we got here. Um, I've heard about adaptive study designs and randomized clinical trials. What are they? Well, adaptive study designs uh, use data from the clinical trial uh, to assign new participants uh, to a treatment with a more optimal outcome. So I've used a, a, a kind of an adaptive design in a study of uh, speech therapy and intervention, LSVT, uh, for patients with Parkinson's disease. And it was a um, called a minimization design, uh, randomization. And what it does is take the characteristics of participants allocated to one treatment group and determine how they, they lack from another treatment group. And uh, then what you're doing is putting a new patient who has characteristics that would compensate in one group into that group. So you're better balancing the group. There are other examples with regard to adaptive design, such as uh, what's called the uh, play the winner, whereby the first patient is uh, randomized to treatment A and uh, as opposed to treatment B. And that patient is followed until it's determined whether they have a very successful outcome, they won, or a failure. If they have a successful outcome, then the next participant is assigned to that successful outcome treatment. And, and that goes on sequentially until the next or a patient in the future fails, in which case then the next patient in the queue gets assigned to the alternative treatment. Now, the disadvantage of that is that the, that the outcome has to be a dichotomous outcome, meaning success or failure, win or lose. And it has to be observed in a relatively short period of time. So if you have a disease outcome that takes a long time to observe, then this is not the design for you. There are other types of, uh, well, actually in clinical trials, when we look at interim analyses, in a sense, we are doing an adaptive design because we are looking at the data, say at 35% after patients are entered, and then we're deciding whether to continue or not. Okay, we're deciding whether more patients should be randomized in this study or not. And then we, if the trial is to continue, we would go to another uh, point in the trial and uh, decide whether to stop the trial early or continue to the final 
sample size. Now, the advantages of an adaptive design are that there, the expected sample size is lower than a traditional randomized design. Well, if you have to recruit fewer subjects on average, then it's more cost effective and fewer patients are exposed to a less optimal treatment. So it's, it's, it's more ethically um, acceptable, palatable, okay? And let's see, I think we have time for one more. Um, you mentioned if someone had any ideas for the core or anything like that, someone wanted to know, um, do researchers need funds available for initial consultations to determine study design? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay, <All right>. perfect. <laughs> so what we would do is sit down because I, I want to encourage you to come see me and mm -hmm. then we'd scope out the, uh, your project. And then we would see whether it was related to a grant application, which case there's absolutely no uh, charge to you uh, as long as we negotiate uh, what the biostatistics contribution will be in the grant application itself. Okay, um, I think we're hitting the mark here. So I'll take any other questions that are remaining and we'll answer those and add them to the website. And um, with that, we're done here. That was a great presentation. I'd like to thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer anybody's questions. Just email me and um, I'll be in touch. Perfect. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you everyone and everyone have a great day. Bye.